What's happening, everybody? GM, GM. What's up, check, everybody? Check. So very excited to dive into this, this conversation, but do just want to kind of set the stage literally and figuratively with uh, some brief introduction, speak a little bit to experience. I, I think we have a very broad range of experience within the music industry, both in a Web 2 world as well as Web 3. So uh, we'll just kind of work our way down the line if you want to kick it off. Yeah, my name is Ask Casimir on all platforms, Twitter, Instagram. You can follow me there. And uh, I've been into blockchain since 2011. And um, during that time, I moved to France and I was a songwriter for um, many studios in France and also worked without, um, within the music industry here in the United States as well as abroad, like um, in Latin America, South America. And um, last year, I developed a platform for music called 360nft.io. And um, what we do is white label glove treatment for artists. So we basically go from the modeling process um, all the way out to like, you know, curating what music goes with the art. And um, now we're moving into, uh, into music experiences. Hey, what's up, everybody? My name's Arts. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Arts is Artsy or Instagram at Reject Dreams or just rejectdreams.com. Um, I'm a hip hop artist, art curator, and event producer. Um, and for the last 10 years plus, I've been in the, around the industry and in the industry, you could say, as an independent artist. Um, I've been on radio, I have songs with certain celebrities. Um, and about 10 years ago, I decided to start changing my actual concerts to mixed media gallery events where I partnered my music with actual visual art to highlight people in my company and my collective called Reject Dreams. I kind of modeled it af after like a new age X-Men. So I would partner my songs with paintings, with comic books, with illustrations, photos, all things of that nature. And then uh, NFTs got into my life about two years ago and I hit the ground running. Um, since then I've done a bunch of events. I've been written in Time Magazine and a bunch of other stuff. But um, that's just a brief intro. Again, my name is Arts, and a pleasure being here. Amazing. And uh, myself, my name is Sam Heisel. I'm the co-founder and COO of NFT Now. NFT Now is a Web3 digital media publication focused on NFTs. Uh, best way to think about it is what Complex is for culture and Billboard is for music. NFT Now is for NFTs. Um, prior to co-founding NFT Now, I was running a music marketing agency. We worked with a, a broad range of different record labels, management companies, help artists grow and build their communities and their fan bases through content creation and social media marketing. And, and prior to that, was working with uh, Gary Vee, helping him stand up Vayner Talent, which was kind of replicating what he did with his personal brand for other talent. Um, I think it's an interesting time in the music industry because obviously there's this kind of massive technological shift. I think there's still in this deep experimentation phase, technological development phase, trying to streamline different experiences. But I think it's important to kind of ground ourselves within the current reality, current problems, and really focus on solutions to, to real problems that have been prevalent in the music industry to date. So before we start diving into kind of tactical use cases with Web3, with NFTs, I'd love to just hear both of your perspectives as it pertains to uh, what are some of the specific challenges and problems that artists in the music industry face that Web3 can help tackle? Um, I would start off by saying, you know, anybody who's been in the music business or any industry, we understand that money and finance comes a big, uh, it plays a big role, especially when you're marketing your music or whatever your product is. Um, and I think what Web3 allows uh, to change in that motto is creating like a creator economy where you don't no longer have to depend on a label or a brand, a corporate brand to be able to finance your career and your dreams and your vision um, but you could create that for yourself as well. You know, I think a lot of these industries are also based on relationships um, and who you know, right? And to, and to get, get you into certain doors. But I think what's, what's refreshing, I can say, is um, I've been in the industry for a while, writing for some of your favorite artists, being on radio, right? And some of you may or may not know me. Um, but Web3 allows a, a fresh perspective into people's narratives and stories. And what it does, I think, compared to the music, the old music industry or traditional music industry, is it allows a new way for the outliers or the anomaly artists, the artists that maybe can't uh, fit into a box, but they're a little bit more unconventional like myself. When I, when I was talking to record labels and telling them, hey, I don't wanna really sell music, 
I want to sell experience. I want to partner my art, my music with art, and I want to do like gift boxing for my fans. They were looking at me like I have four heads, you know. But now, because of the advancement of the technology, um, they can see a way for this. But sometimes, in order to be a, a true visionary and a builder and a creative, you almost have to be a tastemaker before something happens in order for the universe to meet you halfway. So I think, uh, you know, in short. Web3 provides a way to create sustainability for artists that Web2 um, doesn't provide because you would need a lot more ducks in a row. And most independent artists, they're so much, they're creative so much that they don't understand the business side of it. And at the end of the day, it is the music business, you know? Yeah, that's, that's kind of what got me into, um, yeah, congratulations. Go ahead, clap Woo! on that. Um, I wanted to learn the technology so that I can build the platforms to, um, you know, be on the other side of the economics because during the time, um, you know, I was a songwriter and uh, performing and so forth, it seemed as if everything was switching to technology. And so, you know, being a computer science major in college, um, you know, when I got to the point where I was like, okay, I'm going to do a music platform and make it specifically, you know, for artists and by artists. Um, it was something that I really looked into as far as what can set it apart from just selling an MP3, right? Because at this point, I like to make the comparison of NFTs being like the MP3s for the music industry, but just 20 years later or so forth. And so, um, you know, building a platform like 360 NFT where we totally do the same white glove treatment as you would with a label, um, it allows us to really, you know, guide and curate the experiences for the artists along with them. And by being able to decentralize the music industry with what we're doing, um, you know, some of the things that were not possible before in Web 2 are now possible with Web 3. And, um, you know, for example, with DAOs, um, that's something that we're really um, bullish on uh, with 360 NFT and also token curated playlists. So, you know, a lot of problems with Web 2 is that, you know, for example, with Spotify, with a playlist, you know, you got to pay to get on the playlist and it's still a lot of payola. So, it, you know, allowing artists to basically decentralize and, and let the community decide which, you know, which songs should be on the top 40 list, which songs should be, you know, voted into the Academy for the Academy Awards or the, for the Recording Academy and so forth. So those are like the key things that we're tackling at 360 NFT that I think um, sets us apart um, in, in the Web3 space as opposed to the Web2 space. Love that. Um, now, I want to highlight one thing before I share a couple issues and opportunities I see. But you kind of alluded to the fact that like NFTs are the new MP3 of sorts. And I think that's a super important analogy because nobody is, when, when oftentimes when people are promoting and releasing their NFT projects at the forefront of all of their positioning and their value proposition is purchase my NFT. Rather than focusing on the actual value proposition you want to create for fans and delivering them value in those terms. I think... Nobody says, yo, check out this new MP3, right? Like the, the technology is this invisible layer. Um, we actually had a podcast, the NFT Now podcast with uh, Matt Sanders from Revenge Sevenfold, an iconic OG metal band. And he spoke, because they, they've actually done a very good job with their Death Bats NFT project as a modern day fan club of sorts. So definitely would encourage you all to check out that specific project. But in exchange for purchasing Death Bats, you're able to get a portion of royalties. You're able to get access to exclusive areas at their various concerts, exclusive merch, participate in the communi uh, community, dedicated events just for holders. Um, and he said in, in retrospect, after dropping the project, when he started talking about NFTs, like the mainstream market is still very hesitant. Their understanding of NFTs is still very much driven by sensationalist headlines. And um, so when you just say NFT without leaning into the value proposition, he said if they never even mentioned the word NFT, but really led with the actual value proposition of those different perks I just mentioned, fans would be clamoring to get their hands on them. So I think don't focus on an NFT for NFT's sake. Really think about who your audience is, who your fans are, what makes you unique as an artist, and how you can use that to derive what sort of value proposition you want to create to create a stronger relationship with fans. And on the side... Yeah, on the, on the side of um, problems in the music industry, I think there's, 
kind of two problems that excite me, and I think it builds upon what both of you said. I think one is that there ultimately is no middle class in music. You're either a starving artist or kind of top 1% artist that's generating the, uh, the, the vast majority of revenue in the music industry. It's very similar to what a venture capital model is, where kind of the, the home run model. You almost expect that you're going to take losses on nine investments because one's going to return the whole fund and then some. Right. So I think it, it, it's very similar in music, and as a result, there ends up being artists that get shelved if they sign with record labels because the record label loses hope. Um, and it, it just becomes t challenging to have economic viability as a mid-tier artist. I, I think there's an interesting example of RAC. He's been able to generate the equivalent revenue of 10 million streams through 100 different NFT collectors. So I, I think this changes the game as far as rather than having to focus on massive scale, you can really focus on depth and connection with a much smaller fan base and therefore have a more economically viable career. Yeah, I'd like to piggy piggyback off that. For example, um, you know, my parents are uh, musicians. Like, and, you know, in my family, there's been a tradition of being live musicians. Like, my dad's a guitarist. Um, you know, my... my um, uh, godfather, uh, Juju Child, he's a, a blues guitarist and so forth. And um, the ways in which that, you know, they go about um, making their music is such a way that, you know, for example, living in Paris for two years, um, the way that people um, view and curate uh, music and art, I think needs to be recaptured and, and, and Web3 allows that because, <clears throat> for example, a lot of the, the music that I make and, um, and wrote songs for um, are really, you know, kind of be, they're, they're meant to be uh, um, like taste taken in in like a, a more um, intimate setting. And, um, you know, for specific tastes, it might not necessarily be, you know, mass appeal and so forth, but for those people who are like those diehard fans of that particular type of classic hip hop or, you know, whether it be blues or jazz or so forth, um, you know, the, the taste and the wave makers for that might not necessarily be, you know, all on TikTok or, you know, going in the, in the ways that uh, the music industry has moved now with social media. No, I think that's a, a great point, though. NFTs and this technology, um, blockchain, crypto, allows for niche artists to become global artists, right? Um, over this last year and a half, I've brought in over six figures off of my NFTs, right? Not only with just myself, though, but celebrating my wins and my profits with other artists, which a lot of the times in Web2 music industry, that's not often, you know, celebrated, right? I might hire a visual artist to do my album artwork, but it's commission-based. This artist doesn't continue to get royalties, right? Um, so all of my wins have been celebrated. But w more importantly, too, I think that artists can't only depend on sustainability via NFT sales. I was here for the boom, right? I sold a bunch of my own art and music. I collected Bored Apes and Cool Cats and these different things. But for, for people who might have missed that boom or that boat, they're sitting there and saying, oh, the market's bare now. What I've noticed in, in my journey through it, right, is that you have to build incentive and reward and show, showcase people your value and make sure that I think in the Web 2 industry of the, mu of the music business, we devalue the actual property of music and Truthfully, music is contemporary art. You know, it's an artist's soul. It's them being vulnerable. And for you to be able to discover an artist in this space, you almost have to look at it as like discovering Apple when it was a penny stock or when it was only a few dollars. You're betting on the trajectory of an artist. So a lot of my collectors um, early on, they were just hearing my story via Clubhouse, right? I was throwing concerts in Clubhouse where I would spotlight myself and visual artists and tell their story and my story. And during the pandemic, a lot of people resonated with that because they weren't going outside. They didn't really have too, much, uh, too many interactions besides maybe their dog and their wife or, or co-partner, right? So I was able to tell my narrative. And, my and for people who bet on me and bought my NFT, my music NFT music platforms or actually on visual art platforms like Open and so on and so forth. Um, but a lot of those people who banked on me, right, my story and my narrative. And now a year later, you know, I've not only performed times and murder beats, but being seen as an art curator where I'm booking those artists.
what you said, value proposition is very important because some in, in the Web 2 music could have just written me off. But in this space, I'm allowed to um, and, and be my different skill sets, you know, being an event, but being an art curator, you to the next visual art might be in the next blue house, you know, so it's been a, a hell of a journey, you know, been written on Yahoo Finance time. Um, I've worked with the stars. I have a Friday called Alone in the Metaverse, which talks about this journey and uh, celebrities that I for these shows. So, you know, I'm, I'm explaining because it went from me to a music industry to tell my story with a showcasing people my value people on my phone every day doing music with me for help to be a web 2 and web 3 and that was something I always did with my company modeled it after almost age X-Men I wanted to showcase my own super but also showcase other amazing writers and visual artists and so on and so forth so we look at value as just a black and white thing. Like here, I give you something and you give me something. But sometimes you can create value for yourself by your lifestyle, by the things you provide around your creativity or in your skill set that, that might not be your main thing, but the, 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 pack, the things that come with your package, so to say. Yeah, absolutely love that. And I think we got about seven, eight minutes left. So do you want to kind of shift gears and make things a, a little more tactical and just dive into... Um, obviously, there, there's tons of experimentation. There's no one-size-fits-all black-and-white formula for what to do with a music NFT drop or an NFT drop in the music space. But I'm, I'm curious, from your perspective, what models or, or sorts of use cases and drops do you think will pick up the most traction in the next two to four or five years? I'm really bullish on um, AR experiences. Um, that's something that we're building into our V2 of the platform. Um, initially, with the V1 version of 360 NFT, you know, we do the whole whitelist treatment with um, 3D character modeling for the artists and, um, you know, curation of, of the music and the whole production and so forth. And, um, you know, I think that's great. But uh, in the future, I believe that, you know, there's going to be this interactive element that totally uh, uh, clears out the fourth wall and then, you know, you're literally going to be able to have like a holographic Tupac experience and so forth, like right there, pull it up from your phone and experience that. And having that music impact folks like in their real life, I believe is like the, the point in which Web3 and NFTs are allowed. Because ultimately, NFTs is just one layer of Web3, right? Like it's not... Um, you know, all by itself, like it still interacts with all these other layers that are web too. But um, yeah, I'm really bull bullish on AR experiences. Uh, we're, we've got a partnership working with, um, with Niantic and uh, we're doing some really cool things with, uh, with AR. Yeah, um, I agree with her, with her on that. I also would say, um, you know, anything that gives the incentive or reward for the collector to be a part of um, an exclusive experience. So it could be, you know, ticket, uh, tickets to your show or a social club. I've been throwing an event series called NFT Hype Beast. So a lot of my NFTs came with the utility of, hey, you can skip the line instead of waiting three hours online, you can get right in. Um, my most recent uh, NFT drop with Trinidad James, my utility was if you bought 10 editions at $10 each, which is equal to $100. I would showcase your art in my next exhibition. And that was for more artists that couldn't maybe afford my sponsorship packages. But being able to give back to other creators and other brands um, in, a, in a, a give back, you know, charitable type of way. But I think ultimately the, the, the thing that rings the truest in this space, in my opinion, um, you could go through marketing plans all day, right? Uh, but what hit what hits home for mo most of the time what i've seen for artists is telling your why and your story and your purpose and being authentic you know um i picked up a ferocious piece before i ever knew his uh, before i ever knew ferocious the story you know just because i resonated with the art and the fact that he was very young right um so I think telling that why is the thing that penetrates, you know, because you can have the best technology, you can have the, the illest creativity, but if people don't really connect with the purpose, 
you know, then I think there's a disconnect there. So I think the more you tell that, the more you'll fit into the formula of what works for you and what doesn't. I agree with that. And I'd also like to piggyback on what you mentioned earlier with Clubhouse during the pandemic. I think that's where NFTs really got their, um, you know, like their background story because in 2020, you know, I was pitching, you know, sneaker cred, my first startup, you know, we were doing digital sneaker collectibles and I had a whole slide in my pitch deck that was like WTF and NFT and the incubator made me take it out. But now, you know, all I see everywhere is like people, you know, with the hash, what the fuck is the NFT, right? So I think being able to tell the story and then even giving NFTs like a, uh, like kind of a background experience to play within people's lives, um, it really helped to sell it as a, as a concept and as a new technology. Yeah. And then uh, when it comes to like tactical use cases that I think will pick up traction in the next couple of years, I think for starters, it is important to realize that NFTs and Web3 are a part of a broader toolkit of how artists need to go about approaching their careers and building their brands. I don't think we're at a point where you can yet go all in on Web3 and let that carry your career. I think um, there still are lots of other strategies to consider, social media marketing, touring, partnering with different teams. I think when it does come to Web3, the models I see emerging the most, I think there's kind of this this dichotomy between like art and utility driven NFTs, art NFTs, you have platforms like sound that have generated over sound.xyz have generated over $2 million in revenue for different artists by effectively enabling them to tokenize their songs and, and sell an open edition of anywhere from uh, 10 to a uh, thousand different NFTs of their song. I think that gets interesting. I think that's a, a kind of a modern day vinyl of sorts, like the streaming of a music entity that you own, the kind of consumption layer doesn't yet exist. So I think that's more of this kind of like digital collectible. I, I think one really fascinating use case I saw on the Sound XYZ platform, I don't know if any of you from are familiar with Selection, incredible record label, been putting out a, a radio show every Saturday for the past 10 or so years, now on Apple Music, but they actually minted uh, about an hour long DJ mix of about 10 different artists that were featured on uh, the selection roster, all in this DJ mix, and they were able to generate about $80,000 in revenue and instantaneously route revenue that was generated by the mix to the different artists that were featured. Anybody that's worked in like DJ or mixes like knows you typically aren't, like that's for promotional use only to when you get featured in a mix. So to be able to create new value and, and generate income and revenue for artists in that capacity is fascinating. I think what we'll see more traction is with the model for music NFTs and NFTs in the music space is definitely this utility driven side, this modern day fan club of sorts. I think two fantastic examples, I already mentioned the Death Bats Club. I think another one is what Steve Aoki has done with Aokiverse. Um, and I think there, there are some nice things just to keep in mind, like some of the perks I mentioned earlier, but I, I think Illmind, for example, has a club where you can, through owning access to his token, see private streaming sessions. Uh, Illmind is a prolific producer. That's what his fans want from him. They want to see w what's happening behind the curtains with his production. So I think innovating, coming up with things that are unique to you, your approach, your community, um, are, are things that you really want to pepper into the value proposition of your, your membership pass. And I think the beauty of that, too, now is that we're now deeply aligning the incentives of fans in a way that's never been done before. Like fans actually have a vested interest and in, in deeper alignment in the success of an artist. And I think that creates a whole new level of, of loyalty and ambassadorship, which makes this a very fascinating time and space. As you can yeah. see uh, from this panel, yes. diversity matters. So keep believing, uh, keep dreaming, keep doing your thing. And I just wanted to give an invite to everybody here Tomorrow I got a show at SOBs where I'll be doing an NFTR exhibition and a concert for my new album. It's free to get in, so just tap in RSVP and see y'all there. Peace. Thank you, guys. Please give them a, a really good round of applause. Arts, Casimir, and Sam, the Wonder Man.